What is good, homies? This is Chris from the Small Hat Crew. Today we are covering our fourth color. Uh, if you've already seen the previous videos, you already know what we're doing here. If not, though, brief little recap. Uh, essentially going over the history of the color, all the way from the starter to the OPO 1, 2, 3, and 4. If there's any starter decks or structures in between, we'll cover those as well. If there's a relevant promo card that benefits, you know, the color as a whole and not a specific leader, we'll cover that as well. Um, but we're just going to talk about the strengths, the weaknesses of every single color, uh, any struggles they may have encountered, uh, just, just pretty much everything and anything. And I guess with that being said, we'll just go ahead and jump into it. So today we're doing green. So let's just go ahead and jump into it. We'll start with STO2. Uh, it's the structure for Eustace Captain Kid, or uh, as he quickly becomes Useless Captain Mid. <laughs> okay, so cards of note, we have one cost to blocker Veggie. Uh, so fear we immediately see one of the benefits of green is that they do have access to a one cost blocker. Colors like black, yellow, and purple do not get that benefit. So green is one of the cheaper ones. They're lower to the ground. Um, they also have one cost Bonnie. So this is this is one of green's gimmicks, or I guess uh, part of their color identity. Every color gets searchers. Green is the only color that gets a searcher that can be used repeatedly. All the other colors, their searchers are on play. Green can search multiple times. They can tap a Bonnie, and if it survives, they can tap it again on the following turn. They can swing with like a Nami, for example. If she survives, swing and search again. Um, that's that's just something that is unique to green. Uh, Bonnie does it. Momo does it in OPO5. Dofi gets a searcher that does it. The only non-green searcher that can do it is Igaram, a red searcher from OPO4. Uh, we also have Killer. Um, this card, he saw fringe use here and there. He was just something that came out and popped a smaller body. He was pretty good in the beginning, but he did fall off relatively quickly. Um, he was good in decks like Zoro, for example. They turn a body sideways, you just pop it. He killed, or I guess actually he killed Zoro's too, now I think about it. Three calls, 5k. Um, rush Zoro. Um, yeah, he was he was pretty good, but there there's better. Oh, uh, there's five cost law. This has to be like one of the best five cost cards that only sees play in like very, very, very few decks. Like like most cards in a color, if a card's like really good and it's like generic, uh, you'll see that card ran in like every deck with access to that color, like um like Borsalino and Black, for example. Uh, but five cost law, yeah, no, he he only sees use in a couple specific decks. We also have five cost Hawkins. This was a this card was a force. He was so potent in like the beginning of One Piece. This card was like he almost felt like a win condition in himself. Like if he survived, he was hell. He was so miserable. And like he usually made you have to like like there was no good answer to him because if he hit something he was going to restand. He was going to do it again, you know? So usually, like, if you swung at something, you just had to let it die. Um, because if you waste the counter, he'll just swing into it again and now it's gone. Um, usually the only answer to him was, like, Jet Pistol. You had to have Jet Pistol. If you didn't, then, then Hawkins was... Like, they would sit him on the board and you had to answer him that turn. And if you couldn't, then he was just going to run rampant. Because even him surviving just one turn, you know, is a big tempo swing. And then we have Seven Calls Kid. So, um... Here we are seeing another one of Green's, uh, I guess, unique identity traits or whatever we want to call it. Uh, big blockers. Green has the biggest blockers in One Piece. We're seeing it here with Seven Calls Kid. Uh, he attacks and restands, just like Hawkins um, can attack and restand, or Harlock can restand something. So that's another color identity that I did not touch on. Green restands bodies. Um, and then we'll go ahead and end it off with the 2K of the deck there is 2k apu this card is he is only good because he is searchable off of bonnie he's a 2k that you can search other than that this card almost like never is never hitting the board like if he isn't the only like period i could ever even imagine wanting to put him on the board would be like i was gonna say in a white beard meta but that was three straight sets i say like in a white beard meta where like um but even then you wouldn't, because it's like, because it's like, 
In a Whitebeard meta, you, if he leaves like one or two Dawn open, you could swing and and tap one of the Dawn and then maybe try to kill a Whitebeard. But like against Whitebeard, if you put this on the board, he's just going to get Marco'd on the following turn. So like there was never really um, a time where like Apu should be on the board. I'm sure you could probably find a niche theory here or there, but realistically he was just a 2k like 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, honorable mentions for this deck. There is Extric. He is not notable for anything special that he's doing. He is notable for a reason I will mention much later on. And then we have Repel. Repel, this card ne never saw play. Uh, the only reason I'm mentioning this card is because it touches on another one of Green's um, like unique things to it that we, none of the other cards have addressed, and that is Restanding Dawn. Uh, with that being said, that is all of STO2, so we will now move on to OP01, which is the actual start of Green in One Piece. All right, so OP01 introduces us to three new leaders. Uh, the three, we'll go ahead and just start with Law. Uh, I just don't understand what happened here. This leader, this leader is so, so ridiculous. He is an OP01 leader with with the ability of like this man this man almost feels like power creep proof he is this leader plays 13 dawn turns essentially like he pretty much any turn you use the shambles he's pretty much saying i'm playing with three more dawn than i should be that is so insane that is so ridiculous and then it allows for so many just disgusting and cheesy plays um like cheating out five cost luffy's and swinging for rush cheating out law blockers and bouncing like Zoros or Namis or 2Ks to hand. There's just so much utility in it. And then there's also the restand law that I mentioned previously. Uh, that card is so ridiculous in red green law. Literally you swing massive with something or you swing with like your Luffy unblockable and then you just restand it with this law for two dawn and then you swing again. It's, it's honestly so ridiculous. This leader is so overtuned. Um, for what he's the, I think the one thing that does balance him is that Law is I want to say I feel like he is the most skill intensive leader in one piece he does have the highest ceiling and a good law player and a bad law player it's it's they're like miles apart um so Law is it's there's kind of like there's good leaders like Whitebeard that can kind of carry you whereas a good leader like Law cannot you know there, there's Whitebeard there's Zoro Law is one of those leaders where you do have to know what you're doing. If you do misplay, you do feel it. It's a lot harder to recover from misplays. If you mess up your turn, um, you're like immediately aware of it. Uh, and I will say that's why I do think law players are probably the character, or the, they're the players that I do have the most respect for. Um, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Law's whole thing was essentially recycling and opio one is a, it was a lot of just playing bonnie and recycling bonnie with uh you would you would play bonnie you would tap search with her and she would search like a good she searched all of your five cost targets you want to cheat out of shambles she searched five cost luffy she searched the hawkins she searched both of the laws um she could also search little blockers like killer blocker um she even searched like Punk Gibson as a counter event. There was, she searched her 2K and Apu. There was nothing that this deck ran that she didn't uh, like search for the most part. We then move on to our second leader. Uh, so I don't know why OP01 introduced two red green leaders. You know, there, there were so many color combinations that we had not yet experienced. Yet OP01 did two blue purple leaders and then they did two red green leaders. Uh, what I found ridiculous about this one was like with. Blurple Crocodile and Blurple Kaido, you can make the argument for which one you want to run. With Red Green Luffy and Red Green Law, there was never a reason to play Red Green Luffy over Red Green Law. Red Green Law has one of the best leader abilities in the game. Red Green Luffy has one of the worst leader abilities in the game. He has what is, I'm 99% sure, unless I'm blinking, I'm pretty sure he has the most expensive tap Dawn effect in the entire game it is the most expe expensive effect in all of one piece um yeah I'm, I'm i'm trying to think of another example i'm pretty sure tapping four is as high as it gets in this game and if you're going to be the most expensive effect 
then at that point, what is what is the effect that's justifying spending that much of your dawn? That's damn near half of your dawn for the turn. Uh, well, for four dawn, you restand a supernova or a straw hat, cost five or lower. So not only if he just restood something, it'd be one story. But he can only restand two specific types of cards. It has to be a straw hat or it has to be a supernova. That's one limitation. And then on top of that, there is then also a limitation on how high he goes. So he can't restand anything above a five. So that is that is just like, there are two limitations stuck on him. And then on top of that, what he pumps, he pumps it, he restands and he then he pumps it by 1k. If he restood it and pumped it by 2k, that'd be a very different story. If I... If I were to have released this leader myself, instead of tapping four, it should it should be tapping three, and instead of pumping one, it should be pumping two. That I think that would have made this leader so much better. Three, four is just too expensive, and one K is not enough. Um, especially when you consider like he's competing in the same set he came out in. He's competing with Red Green Law. Red Green Law for, is playing 13 Dawn turns. Red Green Luffy is taking four of your Dawn away. Like, it is ridiculous how how gimped Red Green Luffy was on release. Um, and I guess even to this day, they're just like, because even because of the restriction, it's not even like you can even like release more support for him to make him better. Because uh, I mean, like technically you can, but like as, as you're going to see like later on, like more Straw Hats do come out that are so good and he just can't do anything with them. Like if he could, for example, swing with like a Luffy Blocker 7 cost uh, film, if he could swing with that and restand it, that'd be that'd be amazing. But he can't even do that. Like, new cards come out, and because he has so many restrictions on his effect, it just doesn't do anything. We then move on to our final leader of the set, Mono Green Odin. So, there are a lot of leaders that are bad because they didn't get support. That is not Odin's problem. So Odin is discard. A Wano, a Wano cart specifically to restand to Dawn. The problem with Odin is his ability. So in One Piece and most card games, just in general, there is nothing more like important than card advantage. You have a whole color like like say Black for example. If Black is discarding a card, they're popping something with it. So they're trading that card for a one for one, so that goes even in card advantage. Um, if Yellow's discarding a card, they're usually establishing a body out of life. For the most part, if you are trading a card from your hand, you are doing that to establish something or to remove something. It's it's you're you're affecting like card advantage in some kind of way. Um, whereas Odin doesn't do that. Odin is discarding a card for a resource that he's just restanding Dawn, and that just isn't worth it. It'd be one thing too if he just discarded a card and restood Dawn. He has to have a specific type of card that he's discarding. So it's it's the same thing with Red Green Luffy, where it's like an unnecessary restriction thrown on top on top of him. Especially when you consider then as like the sets go on, we start getting other leaders that restand two Dawn for literally like literally nothing. So so Odin is just I feel like they need to come back and they need to errata this leader. Um because his support was actually great. So I will say, I do think he has probably one of the worst cards in the game. And Conjuro, like that, <laughs> that man can only pop arrested characters below a specific cost. And then if he dies, he discards a card from your hand. And then you don't even get to pick what the card is, your opponent does. Literally, I think by, like has to be one of the like bottom three cards in One Piece. But that was like, that's, that's just like a fringe case though. A lot of his support was actually really, really good. So if you look at all the Wano cards that came out, he immediately got a searcher off rip. Momonosuke, uh, like you we were mentioning with Bonnie, uh, Green's whole gimmick with their searchers is they can use them repeatedly. Same applies to Momonosuke. Um, so yeah, it's a Wano searcher that you can recycle. That's good for very obvious reasons. Um, they also had Cat Viper. This is kind of like a killer from the starter where he was pretty good early on and he fell off very quickly. Um, Odin also had a searchable 2k. You could search an Izo off of your Momonosuke. Izo is also just a great card. Like you could take games with him. He could tap down blockers. 
like like there was never if he was in your hand he was a 2k so that's as good as being in your hand is gonna get and if he's on the board it's because he's tapping something so this was like by far one of the best 2ks of opo one probably the only thing better than it was like otama he also had one of the best bodies you could establish in opo one three cost okiku was amazing she was robin on crack this card was so good it could tap down anything five is so high it would tap down queen blockers like there was nothing that this card wanted to tap down that it couldn't it would just tap over so it would just tap something and then it'd beat over it um it would tap down blockers and swing she was just a force to be reckoned with and it's kind of obvious by the fact she has no counter that she had like a very powerful effect um and then you have rizo rizo was just a card where um if you if you had other bodies on the board you would draw a card so there's green generating card advantage once again uh we also had five cost Yamato. she didn't really she not even really she didn't do anything in opo one she even had a searchable event off the momonosuke in paradise waterfall such a good counter event it would just restand something if you swung with your okiku and your opponent was going for her you would just restand her with like a paradise waterfall he had so many good wano cards come out immediately but all of these cards are universal. If you're playing any other green leader, like Law or Kid, for example, you could play these cards if you wanted to. So it's like, why play Odin at that point? Are there any cards unique to Odin? There are. The problem with them is, I guess we'll just go ahead and look at them. So we have one cost Komurazaki. So she restands a three cost or lower character. The only good body you establish in Wano is Okiku. So pretty much, you have a card like Komurazaki, all she's really good for is restanding your Okiku. Um, maybe even a Momo, if you have a tapped Momo, you could play Komurazaki and make it active again. Uh, there was also 6 cost Kinemon, uh, again, so he's doing the same exact thing. He's attacking, he's restanding Okiku. Like, it's almost like they were aware that this deck only had one good body, so all of the cards that are unique to him are pretty much just trying to keep that one body alive they're they're getting more additional attacks out of it they're standing it restanding it to make it um not be targeted by the opponent for combat on their turn um there was just and and because they only had one good body to put on the board all the support kind of just restands it and that also kind of makes it so that if you don't see the okiku those other cards don't do anything they just don't do anything of value um, there was also five cost Denjiro. This card should not have been locked to Odin. Uh, this is a good card. This was this was a five cost seven K that reached it to Dawn. That was like like that card on its own we could like just enable two seven K swings. That's two magic numbers into the opponent. You know, like you could just swing with him. He would swing for eight K. He restand two Dawn, and you just put it on the leader. You could swing for seven K. Like. That is actually really good. It also just gave you two more Dawn to play around with. It didn't take anything out of your hand to do it like the Odin leader ability does. This card should not have, have been locked to Odin. It should have been like locked to a Wano leader so that future Wano leaders could use it. Because more do come out later on down the line. And it being locked to Odin, a leader with a bad leader ability, it's just that's not it. So it's like it's like if these are if these are the cards that are exclusive to you. Why would I ever why why would I ever lock myself into Odin with a bad leader ability just so that I could play cards that restand my Okiku when I could instead play like if I really wanted to I could play Law and swing with my Okiku and then shambles bring out a five cost Law blocker and then bounce the Okiku and play it again active if I really wanted to um, I could just be playing Kid there's just so many reasons all, all the best cards of Wano are generic so at that point you could just play them in a green leader with a good ability instead of handicapping yourself for literally no reason and then we get to the best card of op01 eight cost kid this this card pretty much determined what decks were meta and what decks weren't if your deck could answer a drop kid you were meta if your deck could not you were not it was as simple as that um so for the most part, eight cost kid kept blue from being a color. Um, eight cost kid enabled purple to have good matchups into uh, some of the best decks, like Law, for example. Purple's best matchup was against Red Green Law, uh, so Kaido was viable. Um, Red was also very good 
uh, into this deck. Like, it, also Law, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, I remember there was one Law player that won two events in OPL1, and he said that the worst matchup that the Red Green Law had, his worst matchup by far, was Red Luffy. Um, and that is just because Red in general... And it's funny because in OPO1, Luffy was actually the better leader than Zoro. It was... Zoro had more top 32 finishes than Luffy, but Luffy had more top 4 grand final and event wins overall than Kid. I mean, than um, Zoro. But yeah, because Red just had access to Jet Pistol. They could search it off of Nami. If Red, if, if you're playing against a competent Red player, they would just hold their Otama and wait for the kit to hit the board. And once kit did hit board, they would just Otama it and then Jet Pistol it. And then that was your entire turn wasted. So yeah, like you, you see like this card, this one card defines all other decks like places in the meta. This card was meta defining. It The entire meta was warped around this one specific card. That was, OP <laughs> that was OP01. It was just very, very toxic. You had, um... Luffy players playing like Shanks and trying to rush into it because it would ignore like the the veggie blocker and the um, killer blockers and just go straight into the kid. It it was it was a very fun time. It was a very if you were playing if you were playing OPO one and you were not a blue player you actually probably enjoyed this set unless if you were if you were a blue player you you hated OPO one. All right, so now we move on to OPO two. And here we see Kinemon has graduated from being just a character locked to a, a very mediocre leader to now being a leader of his own. And he's far better than Odin in every possible way. Um, Kinemon's whole thing was cheating Dawn. So, which is looking like it's actually just kind of a green thing in general now that I think about it. Um, but he would lower the call, he would lower the cost of a three cost or higher wano uh, character you would play so like kinemon wanted to go second for second for example so that he could go on turn um one if he was second he could use his leader ability and then play okiku for two dawn then on the following turn he could play yamato for three dawn and then attach a dawn to okiku and swing and tap something and then swing with leader while establishing a 6k body um he could also do things like establish his new win condition he gained eight cost odin in Kinemon, it was a seven cost character. For seven costs, Odin was actually insane. It had one of the most powerful effects I have ever seen in One Piece. The man swung twice for ridiculous numbers, and if he died, he floated into another body from the deck. It was so insane. Kinemon was actually like, there was, an, there was a whole conversation that was going on. Because in OPO2 in Japan, Whitebeard was like a good deck, but it wasn't the tier zero force that we would later like it would become known to be in america there was a conversation for whether it was whitebeard or it was kinemon kinemon was a really 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 good deck overseas did not end up being the case here kinemon was very dominant for about a month so the really interesting thing about kinemon was over in japan and i guess asia as a whole or just i guess that entire um that they're just entire meta Kinemon played fine. They were playing Boatbeard. They were playing Boatbeard, and Kinemon was able to keep up with Whitebeard. When it came to overseas, for whatever reason, we were not playing Boatbeard. Uh, we were playing around with Boatbeard. We ruled that it was inconsistent. We thought it was more high roll. So we switched over to playing Strawbeard instead. And the minute Strawbeard was like figured out as a deck about a month into OPO2, Kinemon died immediately that he just no longer was a viable leader because he just could not beat uh strawbeard whatsoever Kinemon it was like overnight like a, like a, a switch was flipped and Kinemon was no longer meta just just like that he was an amazing leader he had an amazing leader ability he had amazing support he came out he had his own one cost blocker so it was one it was the only green deck that could run eight one cost blockers um with Kozuki Toki. Uh, I think that card has some of the best card art in the game. To this day, Toki is actually like <laughs> in my she's in my phone case. I, I love this card's art so much, you have no idea. Um, but also there was the four cost Yamato I mentioned before that uh Kinemon was cheating out for three dawn on turn two and his power play. 
there was the A cost Odin. Um, he also brought, brought, introduced Paradise Totska. This card doesn't see play immediately, but this card does. I would say it will, we'll talk about it later on, but we won't in this video because this card starts seeing play in OP06 in Yamato. Um, at least that's look, looking like how it's shaping up to be. People are testing it at the moment. It's looking like you run that card, just search it off the Momo, tap blockers, and then swing for double attack with your Yamato leader. And yeah, that was Keenemon. He had the, like, going into OPO2, he was my leader. I started out with him. I played him for a week before I dropped him. One of the problems, too, that he had was he had no counter. You could have a hand of eight cards, and in Keenemon, it wasn't unrealistic for five or six of those cards to not have counter. Like, it was, it was a very common occurrence. The other leader of this set was Blue Green Sanji. He came out with all of one card. He got one card. It was a three cost counter event. So we're already off to a terrible start. Before we even discuss what the card does, just being a three cost event is so expensive. So Sanji was flawed inherently off rip. So he has one of the only leader abilities in the game that your opponent has say in. Your opponent can actually influence whether or not you are able to get your leader ability off. Um, so that was one thing he had going against him. Also, he was a four life leader. He also had access to the blue color pool, and this is back when the blue color pool was really bad. If you had, if you were a dual leader and you had blue, it didn't do anything for you. You know, this is before like Red Rock came out. This is before um, 3000 Worlds was a thing. Like all P gave you, all blue gave you was like Love Love Beam, Doflamingo Blocker, like Mihawk, and that was pretty much it. So he also, he had a bad color combination. He only had four life. He had a leader ability that your opponent could decide whether or not you were going to resolve it. Um, and then his ability also synergized with Vanillas. So it means you have to dedicate a decent amount of your deck. If, because if you want to if you want to resolve your leader ability consistently enough to justify being a four life leader, then you have to run a decent amount of Vanillas. And those are a bunch of cards that don't do anything. Like, usually you just run vanilla stits like magic numbers. Like, Sanji's whole leader ability was just based around it. And then again, at the end of the day, he's just doing it to restand 2 Dawn. Um, and remember, he's not the first leader to do it. Odin was doing that previously. Odin didn't see play. Sanji isn't seeing play either. Um, there was another... So, if you wanted to argue that they did release more cards for him, the argument would be that they did release the film engine. The problem with the film engine is the same problem that Odin had in OPO1. So, the film cards are not locked in any way to Sanji or Straw Hats. Um, if the film cards, like, we have... If the film cards said that they could only play, like, vanilla characters out of the hand, that would be support for Sanji, because it's like, if I want to get the most out of this, this card's effect, I gotta play Sanji. But they're not locked to vanillas in any way, so, again... It's like, if I'm going to play these good cards, I could play them on a good green leader. That's the issue we're running into here. Uh, film introduced three costs Nami. Nami was just a searcher on a 5k body. Uh, she searched film cards. There, were, there weren't there were really that many. Um, there was also four cost Brook. He could play the Nami out of your hand, for example. There was also seven cost Luffy. Seven cost Luffy could play the Nami out of your hand as well. Seven cost Luffy could play the Brook, and then the Brook could play the Nami. Problem with the film engine very early on was... There weren't many targets to search, so like Anami could whiff very often. Um, the package just wasn't very big, and then also the package, a lot of it was just dumping your hand onto the board, so you wouldn't wouldn't really have a hand. Um, and that was just kind of it. That that was a lot of the problem with Sanji. It's like the cards that benefit him are cards that benefit everybody. The only card that really is unique to him is a bad card, so you're not going to play it. So, uh, we'll move on to honorable mentions. There was Cat Viper. This card was experimented with for a little bit. Um, in in Kinemon, people were experimenting with the idea of running 8-cost Odin. Uh, and then Odin, if he died, he could potentially... Usually the play was to play an Okiku out of your deck. But there were also some case scenarios where maybe you want it to flow into a blocker instead. And you wanted it to be a blocker that your opponent couldn't just Vista and pop it. And that would be the only honorable mention um, from this set. I guess another honorable mention would be 4-cost Zoro. Um, he was just a vanilla. 
but he was a vanilla that was searchable off of both Nami and also searchable off of Bonnie. So some, sometimes you would see like law builds would play around with it because both of their searchers could grab him. Uh, but that's all of OPO2. Now we move on to OPO3. OPO3 is bringing us two new leaders. We have Kuro. Um, Kuro was a, he's what you would call like a locals leader. Okay, so when it comes to Kuro, he is a leader that has topped a couple times, but they're very far, far and few between. He's not a consistent performer. Um, he's more high roll. Um, the problem with him is that, so all the power of Kuro is that he is a double attack. He, a double attacker. He can attack twice. He restands himself. So he can attack two times in a turn. The problem with that is for him to do it, he needs to tap two bodies. Ta turning a body sideways in one piece. So remember earlier, somehow how it, like important card advantages. If you turn a body sideways in one piece, you're basically giving it up to your opponent to be able to take it on the following turn. So you're giving up the board. That's that's just never good because card advantage, card advantage is everything. You could argue that the bodies are small bodies that you like play, like you play a searcher maybe, and then you tap it. I mean, your best case scenario would be playing a Nami and then searching and then tapping her and another body. You still, that so that Nami is one of the few cards where she's replaced herself in the hand. Any other card you put on the board once you tap it, you're giving it up. So you are giving up card advantage once again, and you're not doing it for, um, you're giving up card advantage, and the only thing, you don't, like, gain a, res a resource or anything from it. Odin was giving up cards from his hand to gain Dawn. Kuro is giving up cards from his hand to gain an, an additional attack. He's either, he's either giving up the board, he's taking cards out of hand, and then giving up the board. Uh, so he was just inherently flawed. He would do that, and the only way that was ever of doing affecting card advantage was if he was going to take something off the board but at that point that's also very like not favorable giving up your board to take another body off the board that's also not even guaranteed to go through um was just flawed off rip if you did go for the opponent's face too it would be you're basically taking cards out of your hand to give your opponent another card in their hand when they pick up life um he did come out with some support. The most notable cards for him, there was Gein. Gein would tap down two cards. Gein's actually insane. Gein is such a good, amazing card. And I think if this card was not, if this card wasn't locked to East Blue leaders, he would be a problem. I, I like the fact that he is tied to Kuro is probably one of the only things that is balancing him. Um... And then you could combo him with another card like Don Creek, for example. Don Creek would then pop the two cards that Gein tapped. Um, if you were playing against Zoro and they turned body sideways, he'd just come out and pop those. He could just pop anything for the most part, but there was ways to tap cards in a leader like Kuro and then pop them with Don Creek. Another one of the problems with Don Creek was that he would take a card out of your hand to tap. Um, so again, we're looking at another scenario where it's green's problem that we've been seeing repeatedly up to this point is that they are taking cards out of their hand. They're giving up card advantage, but they're not generating anything to compensate for that. You know, you know, like a leader like Sakazuki, if you discard a card, you're going to draw a card to replace it. Again, black, if you're taking card out of your hand, you're going to pop something to, to even that out. Um, Yellow again, if you're going to discard a card, you're going to put a body on the board to make up for that. Um, green is the only color where they don't give up a card from their hand for, for card advantage. Uh, they, they give up cards to do, like, something. They get they gain, like, a resource in theory. You know, like, they'll restand Dawn. They'll they'll tap body. Like, because tapping the bodies doesn't inherently take them off the board. You basically give up a card from your hand to turn bodies sideways. Which is good. You, you still turn body sideways. But the bodies don't disappear unless you then invest a swing into it. Or you play a card that can pop it. A tapped card at that point. So then you have to spend even more cards from your hand. Or you have to give up your swings. Like there were just a lot of problems. Um, and then I'd say another good card for Kuro was something like Django. Uh, Kuro restands himself. And then you can play the Django and then restand Kuro again. Um, a lot of, a lot of Kuro was just like swinging really big with him as many times as possible to close out the game. I'm not going to say that's all he did because th th that's like a very like simplistic way to explain the leader as a whole, but he was very aggressive. 
Um, he has like explosive turns where he can try to close the game out. It just was kind of high roll is all. Uh, and then his hand and event that also did the same thing out of the bag. You would just restand your Kuro and then you could swing your gun. And that was Kuro for the most part. He was a very high roll leader that was severely flawed. Um, and I want to say the biggest part of him was I think Kuro could have been fine. Him giving up the board for an additional attack was very bad, but it wouldn't have been the worst if it weren't for the fact that you had a leader like Kid. You had a you had Eustace Kid, where he would just tap Dawn and then discard a card, and he would do it. He didn't, cause cause it's also like Kid. Sure, he's giving up a card from his hand to do it, and that goes against what I was saying earlier about card advantage. But you compare that to Kuro, who's just giving up two cards basically. He's turning two bodies sideways. Um, not to mention, Kid also didn't take any setup. Kid's leader ability was never dead. Kuro, you had to have the two bodies. You had to, have to be able to tap them to do anything with him. Kid, it was never dead because every turn you at, at the very least had one card in hand from drawing for turn. His leader ability was never dead. The other leader we gained in OPO3 was Arlong. So Arlong, a lot of people like to compare him to Doflamingo. Um, that's not a very good comparison. They are very, they are alike on the most surface level, but that is literally it. They both swing for seven and they tap one and they play a body. They are very different leaders, however. So the thing about them was Doflamingo made it so that you never had to play out of your hand. He made it so that your hand could just grow as the game went on and you could keep generating card advantage. He would play cards off the top of your deck. So he would basically plus one. Every time you swung with him, you would plus one a body and then have a hand to protect that body. Whereas a leader like Arlong, um, not only is he one less life, but he is playing cards out of your hand. So one, you have to already have the target in your hand. Then he plays that target from your hand. So now you've lost a card from your hand. Um, so you, so pretty much as the game goes on, every time you lose, use your, your leader ability, your hand is shrinking. So... You're kind of dumping your hand on the board, and if at any point you lose your board, you have nothing to fall back on. With a leader like Doflamingo, if they answer the body, say he brings out like a boa, for example, if the opponent then goes for the boa, you can protect it. And even if they do take the boa, then you lost nothing. Your hand remains the same. There's literally you if you play boa and they take the body, you're back where you started. There there's no loss in card advantage. You plus one, you broke even when it dies. That is not the case with a leader like Arlong. The trade-off is his bodies do come out active, but even so, um, that's just the inherent flaw with him. He is he was the same he has the same problem that the film package used to have in the very beginning, where you just dumped your hand on the board. Um He did get support. They so because he plays triggers, they did give him a few triggers. Uh he gained cards. So one, he immediately got a searcher. He got Nami. Um, he also got Karubi. Karubi was an amazing card. His stat line is not that great. He is a four cost three K, but you have to take into consideration Arlong is playing him for one Dawn and he taps anything. There is no restriction on what he taps. That's actually amazing. Uh, he also got another body like Chu. Chu would tap, I mean, he would pop a rusted for a cost or lower character. So you could do things like play a Karubi, for example, tap something, and then pop it with a Chew. Um, the bodies, they gave him, like, pretty decent cards, but not enough to to justify. And with him having access to the yellow color pool, he also had access to cards like, like Cracker, Peros Pero, um, things like that, the, the big mom cards. But for the most part, he just wasn't worth it. So now there's also Promo Bartolomeo, this card is a really good addition to the film engine. It gives Nami another card to search. It makes, it also gives them more bodies to play, um, like Brooke and Luffy, for example. You can like swing with your Luffy's now and then restand them off the Barto. Um, it's pretty good. This card was really expensive in the beginning, and Dex opted to run it, and then they started cutting it not too long after. But it was it was nice for a while. You also okay, so now you also have to think too. We are in OPO3. The best leader is still Whitebeard. Typically, when it comes to Whitebeard, the only way you're consistently killing him is with a giant swing, or multiple efficient swings, or you know, two big swings off of like 
restanding. So if anyone had a shot at being Metalista, it would have been uh, Kuro, but it just wasn't consistent. He needs to tap two bodies, and he's playing against a leader like Whitebeard, which has a card like Marco, for example. Um, anything small enough for Kuro to... Because that, that's the thing, too. Kuro's never going to tap anything that's stuck to the board, because against a leader like Whitebeard, it's going to get popped, it's going to get ran over. Um... So that means with Kuro realistically in that matchup, you're like putting bodies on the board and then tapping them that same turn. So that's less done for you to put on the leader. So that's smaller swings you're going to be doing, which makes it even less worth it. Um, so yeah, if Kuro, could, if Kuro wasn't going to be the leader that was consistently beating Whitebeard, then it sure as hell wasn't going to be Arlong. With that, we'll go ahead and move on. So now we're in OPO4. We gain two new leaders. We have... Black, green, Isho. So, this leader, I won't go too much into him now, because I was I went pretty in-depth in the Black video explaining why he didn't see play, what was wrong with him. Um, so, the only thing I'm really going to mention in this video that I didn't mention that one is, um, in that video, I mentioned how they just gave him no green navy cards in OPO4. Uh, so, this is where we're going to talk about the cards I mentioned previously. Uh, the x -Drakes. These are some of the only, if not the only, green navy cards. This is, this is it. You have the black navy you got in OPO2, and then you have the green navy cards you got in OPO1 in the starter deck, and that is literally it. Like, this is the amount of neglect that Isho's looking at. Um, and I won't beat a dead horse. I, I think I spoke about it for, for a pretty long time in the last video, so, um, if you haven't already seen that, go watch that one if you really want to know why Isho, what was wrong with Isho. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the other leader, Green Purple Dofi. So Green Purple Dofi, I also touched on in the purple video, but I, I didn't go as in-depth with him because a lot of Green Purple Dofi, what makes him good is green cards. So more thorough here. Green Purple Dofi was an amazing, or is an amazing leader at the time of making this video. He is incredibly good he just restands two dawn for free um green purple dofi so what made this leader good is the film package that came out in opo2 film dofi film dofi <laughs> god he uses so many film cards i, I just I called him a film leader dofi did get don quixote cards um but for the most part they don't see play because the film engine is so good. Now, you what you may ask, why is it so good now when it's always been a thing and no no leader has broken it previously? Well, that is because he has access to the purple film cards as well. The purple film package is bare bones. There are only a few good cards from there, but the ones that are are really good. And then the problem with the green engine was that like a card like Nami, there weren't enough targets. You now have a pretty decently sized engine. Your Nami's going to hit more often. You also have a 2k searcher in your Buena Fiesta. Buena Fiesta is hitting all the time. You have so many targets. You have your 3 cost Nami. You have your 4 cost Brook. You have your 7 cost Luffy. There's Buena Fiesta. There's Guild to Soro. Um... There is Uta from the starter, the film starter. Like, there are so many different targets. And when you bring those two engines together, they're both pretty mediocre on their own. You bring them together, they are amazing all of a sudden. Seven cost Luffy being able to play four cost film Uta purple is such a power. That's like one of the strongest things you could be doing for seven non. For seven non, you play 11 dawn. That is ridiculous. It's 11 Dawn and you establish two blockers and one of them is interruption on the opponent's turn. That is amazing. Can't, can't overstate or can't understate how amazing that is. Um, so that's one of the things that Film Dofi is able to take advantage of. Um, he's also able to play a card like Guilt to Sorrow because he can see it more consistently because he can search it off of Nami and he can search. That was another thing too. He just had two searchers. He had two searchers and one of them was a 2k, the other was a body. Like, he was so consistent and so good. And then, I guess we will talk about the Don Quixote cards. So, there are a few new cards he gained. He gained two cost sugar. This has to be the strongest two drop in the game, very likely. I think the only thing that would even compete with her would be, like, Dedan. I don't think anything else probably comes, like, even remotely close. 
Sugar would tap something on play and then she would sit on the board and become like like a card like Izo would tap something and then he's just sitting there. Sugar would linger. Sugar would tap something and then on the opponent's turn, she could tap a character of any cost. She would tap literally anything. If they played like a Nami in Search, for example, you could tap like a five cost law blocker. Like it was amazing how good Sugar was. The other card he gained was 10 cost Doflamingo. This card was a win condition. This card could just steal games. Your opponent has to be so careful with how they play their game. And they have to really think about the cards that they're going to turn sideways. Because this card could come out. If at any point they don't leave a body active, this card will come out and take their entire turn from them. And unless they're playing red, they can't put any more attacks on board that turn. They just lose that turn. They establish bodies and pass turn and that's literally it. This is one of the most powerful 10 drops in the game. This card is so amazingly good. Um, he also introduces a brand new event in Spiderweb. This is probably the best counter event in the game. This counter event is so good. That might be overstating, honestly. It's it's still Radical Beam. But this event is amazing. You gain 4k and then you just restand something. This card is so amazing in a leader like Green Purple Dofi. Because he has access to 7 cost blockers in Luffy... Literally, he could just block an attack and then guard out of the next attack with Spiderweb and then restand the Luffy. And that's just like that. That's three attacks stopped. That is amazing. You could even do it with Uta and potentially tap two cards. So she could, on her own, potentially stop five attacks with a Spiderweb. This card is just Paradise Waterfall, but it's so much better. Like, it's crazy how big a difference that extra 2k makes. It does everything. It makes this card so amazingly good. Paradise Waterfall is a good card. Spiderweb is an amazing card. There is one honorable mention. There is one card that was experimented with that ultimately ended up not seeing play. Um, it did end up falling off relatively early on. That was Diamante. Diamante was basically 7 cost kid, um, but smaller. He did the same thing. It's just you would attack with him and then restand him at the end of your turn if you're playing Don uh, Do Flamingo. He'd restand two Don and then. Uh, the Don would restand, and then Diamante would restand. Um, and then I guess the last card I'll go ahead and ma uh, mention as an honorable mention, Viola. Her effect isn't good. She's just a 2k that's searchable. Come OPO5. If Dofi ever does start running his Dot and Kyote cards, then she'll obviously see play as just... She'll, for the same reason Apu did in OPO1. It'll just be history repeating itself. She'll just be a target that you can search. But yeah, um, there you have it. So that is Green's storied history. They were amazing in OP. They were they were the best color of OP01. OP02, they were in the conversation for best deck, and then they immediately fell off. They fell off so hard. In OP03, uh, we start to see a resurgence of Kid. Um, but aside from that, none of the other leaders really do anything. Um and then we have OPO4, where they now have one of the best decks once again. And this isn't even really talking either about, like, you have to remember, too, Red Green Law is also a leader that exists in all of these sets, and he's good the entire way through at no point. There was only ever a small period where it seemed like he was falling off and all players were losing faith in him. And then he won an event, and then just like that, everybody got back right back on him. And then from there, there was never a dull moment with Law ever again. He, he never, like, wavered in play. Um, there was a, maybe another little period where Ace was a leader. Ace was running around and Fire Fist was just popping everything on Law's board. Um, uh, plus, Fire Fist was seeing play in other decks too, like Zoro, for example. Um, some White Beards are teching it as well. But, like, I'll <laughs> a ban list came out and it, it just killed Ace off, and that was the end of that. So, that's the story of Green in One Piece. Um, there's only two colors left. There's either going to be red or yellow. Let me know which you would prefer to see. I think I already know which one I'm going to do. Because I typically, I honestly just hate one of the two colors. But if you like what you saw here, drop a like on the video. Let me know what you thought. And with that being said, until next time, I'll see you guys.